So I'm going to assume the majority of this audience has taken high school biology, that basic study of life. It was in that class when I remembered learning about how this world is created with an interconnected web of species and ecosystems spanning across 890 different ecological regions and comprised of millions of plants, animals, insects, and other wonders, all working together in these systems. I don't know about you, but I got really interested, and I began to dive even further during my undergraduate studies at the University of Central Florida, where we began learning how we've taken inspiration and literally mimicked biological concepts in order to solve some of the world's most pressing challenges facing humanity. That term, biomimicry. In the 1950s, scientists began trying to emulate the photoelectric effect that plants use by studying materials and seeing how to understand how a sun's photon can create clean, usable electricity. And today, in 2012, the solar industry is shining brighter than ever. It's doubled its capacity in the past four years, and it's expected to grow with a limited supply of fossil fuel ahead of us and a growing demand that's expected to reach 9 billion by year 2050. Even if we're talking about how we can solve our emissions crisis and dependence on petroleum at the same time, scientists are trying to plant two trees with one shovel by studying strands of algae that can help sequester carbon pollution from our power plants and literally grow the next generation of fuels that we pump into our gas tanks. To me, it's incredibly amazing to think that there are thousands of examples that are presented to us every single day of biomimicry concepts, but we don't even realize them. So today I want to talk about how organizations can use these concepts of biomimicry in order to help them achieve their desired goal in the most effective way possible. I want to talk about a story of an organization that became a living organism and how causes can expand their horizons of traditional organizing tactics using proven concepts found in nature. I'm going to talk about four key concepts that I've personally seen play a critical role in helping to spread not only our message but our organization. And that's diversity, replication, symbiosis, and the way we structure our organizations. And it's my theory that by incorporating these concepts in our organizations and others, we can actually put our organizations on a path that follow the laws of nature. So to begin, in biology, that term diversity normally refers to and is used to measure how healthy an ecosystem is. It's the variety of life forms within the genetics of a given species, a particular ecosystem, or even a region of the planet. And to put it simply, the more biologically diverse, the better the chances are of survival, leading to these thriving systems, ones that provide pathways for flows of energy and opportunities to flourish in that environment. Now, most of us would think that by having a diverse group of species in a small particular area, that it would lower the chances of each one flourishing. But in reality, their interconnectedness and their ability to work together actually allows them to overcome barriers and threats, such as natural disasters, pests, and even climate change. We've heard that a couple of times today, which I'm happy about. <laughs> What's more important is the fact that this concept of diversity can be incorporated within our organizations. But in our case, it could be the diversity of our initiatives, the diversity of our audience, or even the goals that we're set out to achieve. Instead of being specific to a particular program or niche or even age group, we can create vehicles for our peers around us to actually turn their passion into solutions for the common goal that we're set out to achieve. This is crucially important. Now, by doing this, we set us up in order to help expand the audience that helps us follow our movements. And that brings me to my second point, that of replication. How can we replicate our organizations now that we've captured this audience? See, now replication is really important because it can teach us how effective we are at our impacts. It can teach us how we can copy a successful action seamlessly in a different location, whether it be an effective public transportation option to a new community or installing a new policy within our businesses in order to incorporate sustainability. Various methods have been known to copy and emulate the ways that things replicate and grow in the natural world. So when we ask ourselves, what is the best way to replicate our organization, it's sometimes great to, to compare the difference between a bacteria and a virus. Unlike bacteria, viruses use a living host, right? A plant or an animal in order to thrive and reproduce. Whereas bacteria can grow on non-living surfaces. Now, we can take inspiration of this because 
The viral approach is shown to be incredibly lucrative for organizations, especially if you're a good virus. You can look at the internet world like we were describing today, with things such as Facebook and Twitter, which allow us to connect with people all over the world. Or even the way we're fundraising new ideas and new concepts through crowdsource platforms such as Kickstarter and Indiegogo. Each of these examples have taken that viral approach, but what's interesting, they used each and every single one of us in this room in order to replicate their organization. So, it's interesting to think that by incorporating these viral approaches to our organizations, that we can actually spread our message through another living entity and further our mission in a completely different location. Now, when we do that, we're going to be causing some interactions, especially reaching out into new places. So that brings me to my third concept, and that of symbiosis. The way in which we can actually interact with existing organizations, especially if they have very similar missions and goals as we do. In biology, this term symbiosis is really the interaction between two different species that can derive to a positive, a neutral, or even a negative uh, effect, depending on the type of symbiosis that we choose. If we go with the route of parasitism, we look at non-mutual relationships where one benefits and the other one's harmed, similar to a malaria-infested mosquito that uses humans as the host. If we go through the approach of commensalism, we look at one benefiting and the other not affected, similar to how birds and egrets forage for food behind livestock and cattle that are grazing the grounds. But one concept has been incredibly beneficial for this whole thing, and that's that of mutualism, where two different species, or in our case, organizations, can work together and literally derive a benefit from their interaction. Traditionally, we're looked at and forced to look at adding each other as competition. But we can change the paradigm. We can actually look at each other by adding value, we can help to grow each other instead of trying to dilute our movement or segregate our efforts, even outcompete each other, which will make us more susceptible to those natural disasters that we just recently talked about. So that's really, really important. And I'm going to go with the final point, and that's of how we can structure our organizations to be effective and more successful. Now, the way we can structure can greatly benefit us or seriously harm our mission and our cause. Where centralized hierarchy has shown to be you know, effective and to work, decentralized systems are changing the game, and they're actually expanding in completely new ways every single day. If we take, for instance, the centralized Aztec Indians compared to those that were decentralized Apache Indians. We can even see that human civilizations have outcompeted their competitors by the way they've actually formed their tribes. And an even better example that I personally really like is the difference between a sea star and a spider. Although they virtually look pretty similar, the rise of cephalization in the spider has centralized its nervous system, whereas the sea star works interdependently with each one of its appendices. If you cut off the head of a spider, it dies. But if you cut off the leg of a sea star, it has an opportunity of regrowing that leg, and the leg that was cut off has an opportunity of regrowing into an entirely new sea star. It's fascinating. We can truly incorporate these concepts into our organizations as we're replicating, so that when we do grow these new arms, we're making sure that they're decentralized and completely autonomous. And by structuring ourselves this way, we can truly make our organizations on a path that are leading them to become living organisms. So in closing, I want to share my personal story of, how, of why this is relevant, for one, and how we've helped to create a global youth-led sustainability movement, growing across universities, K-12 schools, and communities around the world. And what we're doing is working with youth leaders and emerging professionals to address these challenges that are facing our communities. We call ourselves IDEAS, and we work together to create intellectual decisions on environmental awareness solutions. And it was through these effective organizing tactics that we were able to grow from a single student organization at the University of Central Florida in 2008 to now a global movement that has educated, engaged, and empowered over 10,000 people around the world spanning across 25 chapters in the United States, 15 countries internationally, and growing every single day. I sometimes get asked, how did this whole thing start? Well, truthfully, it started with a small group of dedicated students who were looking to make a change on campus. We adopted a lake, 
And in no time, ideas grew into a hub for innovators, for thinkers, for aspiring leaders looking to turn their passion and their bright ideas into solutions that we can solve on our campuses. And before we knew it, that turned into a movement. I think what's even more fascinating is the way that each one of these concepts I've talked about have been a major critical reason of why ideas is where we are today. The diversity of our initiatives has opened up to people of all disciplines, all majors and all ages. And collectively, we created 40-plus different initiatives and growing to help us address the energy, water, food, waste, and ecological issues that we're facing. We call those the five pillars of sustainability. The way we've replicated is we've taken that viral approach and we use universities and academic institutions as our host that can provide funding and resources and the connections needed to create a solid group. Over the years, we've created mutualistic synergies with other entities and created affiliate partnerships with over 50 different nonprofit and companies around the world. And just recently, we became accredited by the United Nations and were invited down to Brazil in order to join the UN Conference on Sustainable Development. And in years to come, we're going to have a seat at the table for these high-level negotiations on sustainability that are changing and paving the way for our future. And I think finally, we've created this decentralized approach, the C-Star model, where each one of these organizations are running completely autonomously with their own leaders, using their own resources, and addressing their own challenges locally that they face. In short, this movement is turning our ideas into positive change. And we're not just spreading ideas for you or for me. More importantly, we're spreading ideas for us. Thank you very much.